This week on Brian Ross Investigate, messing with our water, an attempt to contaminate the drinking water in a Florida town reveals a gaping national vulnerability. Investigators are trying to hunt down the person who tried to poison a public water supply remotely. Who's guarding the safety of our water, our electricity? Former U.S. cyber counterterror czar Richard Clark with some disturbing answers. If you retaliate against China, if you retaliate against Russia, they can turn out the lights in New York, or they can uh, stop the water flowing in Houston. Plus, the secret life of teenagers during the COVID-19 lockdown, growing concern about a rash of suicides. We've seen uh, several suicides in recent weeks of public school kids. That is very, very painful. A year of no proms, no graduations, no sports, but lots of cheating. They're feeling unmotivated. Um, they do cheat um, in order to get by. And this week's winners and losers in the media. See if you agree with the choices from the editors of Mediaite. How do you justify leaving in the middle of all this instead of getting out there and seeing what you can do with your, with your hands to help? From the Law & Crime Trial Network, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to our friends on Facebook Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined by my colleague at Law & Crime, Rhonda Schwartz. And Rhonda, we begin with troubling questions about the safety and security of our water and power supply. We've seen the vulnerabilities of those two essentials in Texas as a deep winter storm hit there with a deep freeze, raising questions about that state. But even more troubling, perhaps, was a little noticed event in Florida, where officials discovered someone had hacked into the computers of the water district and tried to add dangerous chemicals to the water supply, Rhonda. That's right. The FBI and local authorities are now investigating a cyber attack on the water treatment plant in the small town of Oldsmar, Florida. A very alert engineer spotted an electronic intruder trying to take over the control panel and was quickly able to shut it down and prevent what appeared to be an effort to poison the water supply, Brian. Now to a shocking case of computer hacking in Pinellas County, Florida. Investigators are trying to hunt down the person who tried to poison a public water supply remotely. Hacker gains access to the computer system that controls the water supply for a small city. The system was only breached for about five minutes, but in that time, the hacker was able to increase the amount of a dangerous chemical in the water. Thankfully, a plant operator noticed the system being accessed remotely and quickly caught on to the potentially harmful change and reverted the levels. We're joined now by Richard Clark, the country's one-time cyber czar and a leading expert on cyber terrorism. Mr. Clark, thanks for being here this evening. When we see what happened in Tampa, it is a wake-up call to what can happen with cyber terrorism, the real threat every American may face. Well, that's right, Brian, but this is something that we've known about for almost three decades. A presidential commission reported in 1998 that water systems could be attacked uh, over the internet. Uh, and other things have happened since then uh, to prove them right. The Russians attacked the Ukrainian electric power grid and turned off the lights in half of the country. Russia appears to have figured out how to crash a power grid with a click. Nearly a quarter of a million people lost power in this small Ukrainian city when it was targeted by a suspected Russian attack last December. So we know not only theoretically uh, utilities can be attacked uh, over the internet, but in fact they have been. And yet, Brian, despite all of that, uh, over the last 30 years almost, uh, the U.S. government has not regulated public utilities in a way uh, that makes them secure. And how vulnerable are they at this point? Well, it varies. Uh, I think the gas pipelines uh, are much more vulnerable uh, than the others. I think some big city water systems are fairly secure. But small towns like this place in Florida uh, are not. Uh, and the problem with the, the, the water systems is that in addition to providing us with water, uh, they have, many of them, uh, large tanks of chlorine gas, which they use uh, in small amounts to purify the water. Now, chlorine gas, you might recall from history, is what was used in World War I by the Germans and the British to kill each other. It was a chemical weapon. 
And so if somehow you can get into the controls of a local uh, water system and open the valves uh, of the chlorine gas and let that cloud float out into the community, uh, you have a lethal situation. The hacker changed the sodium hydroxide from about 100 parts per million to 11,100 parts per million. This is obviously a significant and potentially dangerous increase. Uh, sodium hydroxide, also known as lye, is the main ingredient in liquid drain cleaners. What do you make of the effort in Florida? Was that an amateur or was that somebody who knew what they were doing? Well, it's certainly somebody who knew what they were doing, but they might also be amateur. Uh, I, I don't think necessarily that was a state actor. Uh, I, I recall situations where we thought attacks were state actors, and when we actually ran it to ground, we found uh, in 14 year old boys. Uh, so you can never tell with this kind of an attack. It's not that sophisticated that it has to be a state actor. Uh, but, you know, the electric power grids also vary in, in the quality of their security. Uh, some of the bigger companies, um, Southern California Edison, uh, Con Ed in New York, uh, they're fairly secure. But there are, as a result of deregulation, thousands of electric power companies uh, that generate or transmit. Uh, and the, although there are rules about cybersecurity, uh, they're not really uh, audited uh, by any third party auditor. Uh, occasionally somebody uh, sees a violation uh, and a fine is imposed, uh, but there's not a real rigorous system of hunting down vulnerabilities. We saw last year uh, a discovery that transformers, big giant electrical transformers uh, being used on the power grid that were made in China have a back door in them that allows the Chinese to come in over the internet and get into the transformers. And these transformers are on our grid throughout the country. What worries you more, the big state actors, Russia, China, perhaps Iran, or criminal groups that might try to use extortion to get money out of doing all this? I worry most about the big state uh, actors. I think if, if there were ever a conflict or a crisis, uh, let's imagine a crisis between China and the U.S. over Taiwan uh, or the South China Sea or Hong Kong. Uh, let's imagine a, a crisis between us and Russia over Poland or Latvia or Ukraine uh, or, or some crazy idea like the Russians interfering in our election. Uh, <laughs> you know, if there were a crisis and we needed to retaliate, I think the president needs to be told uh, the person who, you, who has the job today that I used to have uh, will have to walk into the president and say, President Biden, if you retaliate against China, if you retaliate against Russia in these ways, they can turn out the lights in New York or they can uh, stop the water flowing in Houston. So it creates an entirely different dynamic. And from your point of view, do you think they are in there already? Oh, yeah, I do. You do. Uh, I do. And, you know, the, the last administration uh, actually leaked, intentionally leaked from the White House, uh, the fact that we're probably doing the same thing to them. Okay, so we're probably in the Russian power grid. Now, let's say they turn off our power grid and keep it off by exploding the transformers and exploding the generators. And we do it back to them. Well, as the people of Texas know this week, um, not having electric power in winter uh, is pretty awful. And the fact that you've imposed that same level of suffering uh, on the people of Moscow or the people of Beijing doesn't make you in Houston any warmer. <laughs> um, I, I joked once that you know if, if we and the Russians do this to each other, they'll have the advantage because at least they have a lot of vodka so who would be the first to pull the trigger in a situation like that? Or is it sort of a mutually assured uh, destruction? Well, so the advocates of cyber war say it's mutually assured destruction, and this is a good thing. Uh, people like me, however, worry that it creates what we call crisis instability. It creates an incentive in a crisis situation to go first. And that's the kind of dynamic that you never want 
that when a crisis is escalating, one side thinks I have to pull the trigger before he does uh, or she does. That's um, that's a recipe for a, a major a major situation. All right. Well, quite the wake up call, Richard Clark. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you, Brian. Coming up next, the secret lives of teenagers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Loneliness, anxiety, cheating, suicides. We'll talk to a leading child psychologist. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. It's been almost a year now since the country went into a COVID-19 lockdown. Tough for everyone, especially teenagers who have been cut off from friends and teachers facing new social and academic challenges. And child psychologists say they've seen a disturbing spike in anxiety, depression, and suicides, something the mayor of New York took note of. We've seen uh, several suicides in recent weeks of public school kids that is very, very painful. And I'm speaking now, not only as mayor, but as a parent. Uh, the fact that these kids have gone through this crisis, the trauma they've felt, many kids have lost loved ones. Many kids are feeling really isolated in the absence of you know, the regular rhythms of their life and particularly uh, the absence of school for some of them. This is why it's imperative we bring back school as quickly as possible. We're joined now by Karen Mosk, a child psychologist in Maryland. Karen, thanks for being here. Teenage years are always full of angst, but particularly during a pandemic, what's happening with teenagers? Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. The kids that I know, the kids that I see in my practice are having a lot of difficulty for, for multiple reasons. Um, first, you know, teenagers don't really have the sense of perspective that adults have. Teenagers feel that now is the only time they can't imagine life in the future. The way adults sort of look back and see, okay, it's gonna change. Teenagers really feel like now is forever. Um, and now is hard. Um, they're isolated. They feel that they're not um, having success in school or socially. So that lack of perspective is one of the reasons why I'm seeing a huge increase in depression and anxiety among our teens. One study found that a quarter of all teenagers had suicidal thoughts. And we've seen a spike in suicides in New York and elsewhere. Uh, do they talk about that with you? Yes. Um, it's one of the things that I ask everybody that I see. In the past, I didn't have to necessarily look at suicidal ideology as deeply as I do now. But the sense of things not getting better, the sense of isolation, feeling unsuccessful has really caused a lot of despair. The good news is, is, is that kids are, they're able to get better. They're able to, as long as they can connect and talk to somebody, usually they can find purpose. They just have to do it in a different way at this point. Is there any good news in all this? Does the fact that they're not in the high pressure cooker situation of classrooms, is that a plus in any way? It can be. Um, in my experience, there has been, there are different types of kids. There are the very high achievers who are focused on their grades. And for those kids, it has released some of that pressure. They continue to do well. They're continuing to do everything that they're asked, but they don't have the intensity of getting up very early or late nights of homework. They're getting more sleep, more family time. And so for those kids, there is, there has been a, a slight benefit. Um, but for, for many kids, um, achievement is an issue because they're not they're not internally driven for grades. And usually kids who aren't internally driven to get those top grades want to achieve because of the relationships that they have with their teachers. They want to achieve because of eligibility status at schools. Um, they want to achieve because the kids around them also want to achieve. And when you take all of those things away, 
is seeing a lot of kids sinking academically. And has this led to any sort of cheating? Do they do their work? Are they, are they turning in their papers? There's a lot of cheating um, going on right now. And um, kids feel like they're not learning. Um, the kids that I see, some of them feel that they're not learning because they're not paying attention. They're feeling unmotivated. Um, they do cheat um, in order to get by. And we talk a lot about how this is just a crisis year. Um, kids will recover academically. I'm not as concerned about that. Um, it's the kids who aren't doing their work. They're not completing the tasks. And those kids actually are failing. Um, I don't know how many, but uh, certainly in my practice, I'm seeing some of that. So Karen, for the parents, this must be also a hard time if they don't quite understand what's happening with their teenagers. Yes, what I found, Brian, is that a lot of kids have feelings they don't understand and cannot articulate that to their parents. And sometimes I get a call from a parent who knows something is off but isn't sure exactly what's wrong. And when I meet with a child, I'm very surprised at the depth of their feelings. Um, and so there is a, even though you're around your children as much as you are, or your children are around you as much as they are, there is a disconnect on, in terms of understanding each other's perspectives. So there is sort of a secret world for some teenagers. Yes. And it's not so much that they're hiding it from their parents, although of course some of them are, it's that they don't even understand exactly what they're feeling. And there is a sense of shame around that. All right, very good advice. Karen Mosk, child psychologist in Maryland. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Brian. Coming up next, this week's winners and losers in the media, including the Texas reporters who chased after the senator who is now and forever known as Cancun Cruz. You're watching Brian Ross Investigates on the Law and Crime Trial Network. Time now for this week's winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediate. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor-in-chief of Mediate, which, like the Law and Crime Trial Network, is part of the Dan Abrams Media Company. Aidan, we begin with a winner, the reporters in Texas, who went on the hunt for Ted Cruz, the senator who took off for Cancun in the midst of a crisis there, earning the nickname Cancun Cruz. They pressed him hard about why he had gone. People whose children don't have heat and power, mm -hmm. how do you justify leaving in the middle of all this instead of getting out there and seeing what you can do with your, with your hands to help? Well, look, in hindsight, if I'd understood how it would be perceived, the reaction people would have, obviously I wouldn't have done it. It was a mistake. What do you make of that response, Aiden? The Texas reporters were very aggressive in going after Senator Cruz. Yeah, so this is one of those old school political scandals, I think, uh, that is really well suited for local reporting like that. Um, you know, in, in the history books, it'll be in the same chapter as Chris Christie getting caught enjoying an empty beach in New Jersey during a government shutdown. <laughs> um, but local Texas reporters were really instrumental in reporting the story out. Um, and you have to, I think, put into context that these newsrooms were reporting last week during a devastating winter storm and power outage that rocked the state. And so they're working under these really tough conditions. And you still had a throng of local reporters uh, that were, you know, engaging the time-tested tradition of showing up at a politician's doorstep to confront them on their screw-up. Um, that video that we just showed, you know, was uh, an ABC 13 uh, reporter grilling Ted Cruz about uh, the decision to leave to Cancun um, while his state was dealing with this crisis. Um, but there was also this great uh, interview that Ted Cruz got with a gaggle of reporters where they were grilling him outside of his home in Texas about the decision to flee the state. And I think in an era when, you know, you have so much hyperpartisan siloed media where Ted Cruz can just appear on Fox News for an interview with Sean Hannity and not get questioned about this stuff, it's always heartwarming as someone that covers the media to know that a politician will still face tough questions on their doorstep from local reporters. Indeed. And now this week's losers, uh, Greg Kelly at Newsmax, who had the courage to go after not the president of the United States, but to go after his dogs. Millie had like a staff and they really took care of her, very beautiful dog. 
This dog looks like from, I'm sorry, from the junkyard. And I love that dog, but he looks like he's not been well cared for. No, not, not <laughs> at all. Thank you for having us. Uh, no, he looks very dirty and disheveled and uh, very unlike a presidential dog. So, Aiden, what do you make of that, an attack on the uh, first dogs? Well, so Greg Kelly, uh, believe it or not, is the star anchor of Newsmax. Uh, he's the primetime host over there. Uh, and Newsmax is, of course, a uh, pro-Trump uh, conservative TV outlet that has been challenging Fox News in recent months. Um, you know, I think the segment in which uh, Kelly attacked uh, Joe Biden's uh, dog uh, as dirty and even brought on two historians uh, to join him in a pretty absurd segment about it uh, is good evidence that the, the network is not really ready for prime time. And that when it has a bunch of eyes on it, watching it, um, you, you really realize that it has segments like that, which come off as sort of amateurish and, and a little insane. Um, so, yeah, I think it's worth remembering that this is a this is a prime time show on a news network. Um, let's not get that lost. Uh, that is actually challenging Fox News right, right now. And they're struggling to stay ahead. They had some momentum after the election, but they seem to have lost that a bit. They have lost that a bit. You know, right after the election, when Trump supporters, which is a really huge and engaged audience, uh, were jumping ship from Fox News and going to Newsmax, mainly because Fox News, despite all of its uh, support for the president, was not engaging in the fantasy that Trump had actually won the election until it was stolen from him. Newsmax was. They were holding out hope, particularly hosts like Greg Kelly. And he saw his ratings surge because he was selling that lie to viewers. Um, that has seeded from so, view now that Joe Biden is obviously president um, and their ratings have gone down in the aftermath. So he yeah. So now they're going to go after the dogs. We don't know who's next. Aiden, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks to all of you for watching. And thanks to the staff at Long Crime for getting us on the air and off. The air.